Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you've all had time to grab drinks and things and welcome to all of those of you who've uh, come in uh, since I last mentioned something. Um, it's good to, uh, good to be able to talk to all of you uh, this afternoon. Um, so just to kick things off, uh, first of all, my name is Anthony Shaw. I'm a diagnostic physicist and I work at uh, UK AEA. Uh, specifically, I work on the JET Tokamak um, which is one of the two devices that we have on site. Um, and my aim today really is to tell you just a little bit about the kind of diagnostic um, work that we do on these kinds of machines and how that sort of thing actually happens with such difficult um, conditions, how we actually go about measuring things in uh, very, very harsh conditions. Um, I'm aiming for the talk to probably be around about half an hour or so, um, and I'll be dipping into quite a few uh, different topics. Um, and afterwards, I'm also happy to uh, stay on the line and uh, talk to anyone and answer any questions as, as well as I can anyway um, about anything you, you may want to discuss. Um, on that note, um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction to uh, fusion and, and plasma physics. Uh, very, very basic, just to uh, sort of get everybody up to speed. If you haven't been following um, the UKA webinars up to now, um, so that you'll have a, a little bit of background on, on what's going on first. And then I'll get a bit more into um, what I'm actually going to uh, discuss about the, the diagnostics themselves. Um, so to kick things off, um, I've already mentioned fusion plasma once. Um, and what is, what is that? What am I talking about? So um, fusion plasma um, is something that we create um, when we're studying nuclear fusion as a power source. Um, and what we currently have normally in operation at the moment is considered nuclear power uh, is called nuclear fission. And what that boils down to is basically having a single nucleus um, that's rather large and splitting that into two smaller nuclei, uh, which end up, ends up actually creating energy. Nuclear fusion is the exact opposite of that process, although normally using different nuclei. Um, you start with two small ones, smash them together really quickly um, and you can get them to fuse and actually produce a, uh, a larger nucleus. Um, normally we use rather small uh, particles for this. Specifically, we use isotopes of hydrogen, which is the, the smallest element we can get. Um, this is a, a quick diagram of the uh, kinds of particles that we use or we look to use for, for fusion power. Um, so at the top of this diagram, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, we have the two uh, initial uh, reactants for the reaction. On the right here is our, our slightly lighter um, isotope of hydrogen. This is called deuterium. Uh, the red particles in this represent protons, positively charged uh, parts of the, the nucleus, and the blue bits are neutrons, which are neutrally charged. So this is hydrogen because it's got one proton, but it's heavy hydrogen because it's got one extra neutron. And on the left side over here, we've got tritium, which is again hydrogen because it just has one proton, but it has two neutrons, so it's ultra heavy hydrogen. And when we get these two to fuse, um, they will actually produce a helium atom, uh, well, a helium nucleus. Uh, so this is helium because it's got two protons and two neutrons, so that's nice and stable, and it'll produce a neutron. So as you can see, we've conserved the total particle number. But there is a key uh, to this reaction, which is that these products are actually lower in mass overall than the original two reactants. And that's to do with how the nucleus binds together. Um, but what we've done here is we've converted some mass into energy. And because energy is uh, mass at the speed of light squared, and the speed of light is a very, very large number, 300 million meters per second, um, you get an awful lot of energy out of this. And it's why nuclear uh, reactions in general are relatively good for, for power. And it's why we research these things. But this reaction is quite tricky. Um, as you can see at the top there, we've actually got two positively charged overall particles that we want to collide. And as you'll know, if you've ever tried to put two poles of magnets together that are the same, they will repel one another. So we need them to have an awful lot of energy to actually overcome that force so that they can fuse. So to do that, we need to put it in some pretty extreme conditions. Um, the sun, for those of you who are unaware, is a, an example of a fusion reactor that you see every day. That's fusing hydrogen in its core, um, not to produce the kinds of pr products that we normally do, 
or what we're looking at on Earth, but nevertheless, it's it's doing the same kind of thing. And as you can imagine, that's pretty hot. Um, that's about 15 million degrees centigrade at the core. Um, and those are the kinds of temperatures you need to get particles to fuse. Um, temperature on a, a sort of atomic scale is basically just the movement of particles, how much energy they've got, kinetic energy specifically. Um, and for reference, um, it's about 150 million, uh, sorry, 15 million degrees in the center there. Um, and its core density um, is actually about 10 times that of lead. So it's, it's incredibly dense and incredibly hot. And those are the kinds of conditions that you need to get fusion to happen. Now on Earth, um, it's going to be very hard to try and confine something that's that hot and that dense. Um, we just don't have the equipment um, to confine anything like that. As you can imagine, a you know, centimeter cube of, of lead, 10 times heavier than that, and then at 15 million degrees, it's going to burrow through whatever desk you put it on and through the ground and probably most of the way to the core of the Earth. Um, so we don't have exactly the same conditions. What we do is we actually sacrifice the density a bit. Um, the density of the material that we're talking about for uh, fusion reactors that we use um, is actually about the same, uh, I found out, as the mesosphere, which is about 75 kilometers up from the surface of the Earth. Uh, which is higher than any sort of balloons go, higher than any planes, certainly. Um, so you only tend to find space shuttles and things there passing through. Um, so it's very, uh, very much less dense than air. So to compensate, we need some pretty significant temperatures. And the temperatures we need are some, something in the order of about 10 times that of the center of the sun, around 150 to 200 million degrees. And that's, uh, that's pretty substantial. And when you get matter to the, these kinds of temperatures, even the same as the sun, actually, uh, you end up with this uh, other state of matter. So you'll have heard of solids, liquids, gases, and basically as you add temperature to matter, um, as you add energy, it uh, changes state. And plasma is effectively the fourth state of matter, as it were. Um, so as you add more and more energy, um, the particles move uh, more and more independently and if you keep adding energy well past from solid, they're all very you know, regular in a liquid, things can move around a bit more in a gas, they're basically free to move in whatever container they have. If you keep adding even more energy, it gets the particles have so much kinetic energy, they, uh, the positively charged nuclei and the negatively charged electrons can move separately from one another. The fact that they're um, attracted to one another doesn't really factor in, they're moving so fast. And so what happens is you end up with a gas that is um, electromagnetically charged. And what that means is you can control it using a magnetic field. And if you put, uh, you put that plasma in a electromagnetic field that is of this kind of shape um, here, this is, it's what's called a torus shape. Um, you can actually confine particles in a sort of magnetic bottle. And that's what we do um, at UKAA. As I say, we have, we have two machines. I'll be talking, the one I have most experience on is, is called JET, the Joint European Taurus. And this is an image of the inside of the machine. Um, for reference, a, a human standing in the bottom uh, will probably come up to around about here uh, on the machine. So it is pretty pretty substantial piece of uh, scientific kit. But that's what we need to measure. So we're looking at trying to measure something that's, um, you know, about 10,000 times more rarefied than air and at 200 million degrees inside this chamber. And that's pretty tricky. There are a number of reasons, though, that we do need to measure this and understand it. Um, there are three major roles of diagnostics on a machine like this. Um, the first one is control. So it's a little bit like your speedometers and your rev counter in the car. Um, if you don't have an idea of, of what it's all doing, you're not going to be able to control what it, what it is doing. So we have to have an understanding for that reason. Uh, the second one is protection. Uh, it's a rather expensive piece of scientific equipment. We don't really want to be doing too much damage to it. Um, and if you're anything like me, your dash might look a bit more like this. Um, but what this is doing is it's, it's telling you, look, there's some kind of issue or something you need to pay attention to, you know, relax a little bit, maybe with your driving, that kind of thing. Um, and the same is true with, with these kinds of plasmas. You need to pay attention to anything that, that could cause you difficulty. 
And the final diagnostic role is, is the one that's most commonly thought of, which is experimentation. Um, we're trying to understand how these plasmas react to how we, uh, how we manipulate them so that we can go ahead and try and build a power plant out of these things. Um, and so we need to understand, we need to be able to measure our successes and measure how the plasma is reacting to things so that we can design better machines in the future. Um, we also want to measure lots and lots of different things, and we want to measure them in lots of different areas of the machine. Um, so we want to measure temperatures, obviously. If we need high temperatures, we're going to need to measure them. Um, for a sense of scale, some of the numbers on there are useful to convert uh, the numbers we normally use in terms of electron volts um, to Celsius. Note these are actually in milli electron volts. Um, we tend to deal in electron volts, uh, so things are pretty, pretty high temperature. Um, densities as well. As I've mentioned, we need, we need the densities to be right. We need to understand what the makeup of the plasma looks like. Um, and this is an example just of a you know, distillation column, effectively figuring out where, where everything sits. Um, magnetic fields, we've got an awful lot of those inside the machine, some of which we create and some of which are created by the plasma as it's moving around. We've got lots of charged particles that create their own um, magnetic fields. And electric fields as well. Again, charged particles moving in these kinds of areas will create um, electric fields that we will want to understand. And finally, um, radiation. Uh, and this can be in lots of different forms. So this can be in the form of light waves um, or particles uh, that can come off the plasma. Um, and uh, just a note um, later, uh, I'll talk about what I mean by radiation and particles. Um, but this is going to be quite difficult. I've already mentioned a little bit about the kinds of conditions we have, um, but it's going to be difficult because of the temperatures involved. Uh, we can't exactly stick a, a thermometer inside. Uh, it's not going to react particularly well to those kinds of temperatures. Um, magnetic fields, um, the fields we're talking about are pretty substantial um, on the order of the same as sort of the center of an MRI machine. Um, and in case you haven't seen what happens when you leave uh, things in the room with an MRI machine, uh, things like this can happen and uh, do seem to crop up on the internet on, with a fairly regular basis. Uh, radiation is also a, a difficulty, a concern. Um, lots of the equipment that we use to measure this is quite delicate and we don't want it to get damaged by these kind of radiation fields. Um, this is an example uh, just on, on the left there of what happens to glass in a particular radiation field. So. Um, the sort of clear glass here on the left um, is before being incident with a lot of radiation. And then on the right is this much darker blue, which has been caused by exposure. Um, and finally, a vacuum. Um, before we add our fuel to the inside of this chamber um, in jet, um, we actually have a, a vacuum that's about the same as that of uh, the International Space Station um, in terms of space. So it's, it's a, what's called an ultra high vacuum. Uh, and that means we can we can add uh, a very, very small amount of, of plasma in there and still control it, but it makes measuring things again more difficult because you can't just um, you know, put gas in and, and, and check things out. So there are two main ways that we can probe a plasma. Um, and the first one is passively. So we can we can try and detect any particles, any radiation, any electromagnetic fields that are just given off by the plasma under normal operation. And the second thing we can do is actively diagnose. So we can inject particles, we can inject radiation, we can inject electromagnetic fields and see how the plasma actually reacts to those new circumstances. And by doing that, infer some things about the plasma itself. Um, a quick note on the terminology, as I mentioned, um, I'll be using the terms radiation uh, a fair amount. Um, if I do use that, I, I might try and be uh, explicit with it. But if I do use it, I will mean electromagnetic radiation. So this is effectively light waves. Um, and that can be all the way from uh, radio waves um, here on the right, all the way up to sort of you know, gamma rays, X-rays. Um, and here in the middle is your sort of visible spectrum of light. So you can go ultraviolet or infrared either side. Um, if I talk about particles, uh, that will be when I talk about more substantial things. So uh, the neutron, for example, that I mentioned in the fusion reaction earlier on, uh, 
um, that uh, that particle comes out at about 17% the speed of light. Um, so that's a very high energy, uh, but it's a particle. It's not a it's not an electromagnetic wave. And also things like alpha and beta particles, which you may have come across if you've done sort of uh, GCSE physics, that kind of thing, which are other types of sort of particles and sometimes referred to as radiation. But I'm going to try and try and keep to my distinction as best I can. So what I'm really going to do is go through an example of some of these types of diagnostics. Um, and to begin with, uh, from the passive side, uh, we do have cameras on the machine. Um, I've mentioned, of course, that we've got a vacuum and it's all very tricky. You've got to keep a vacuum chamber there. But just having a vacuum chamber doesn't mean you can't put windows on it. And that's what we do. We just have very uh, nice, thick, chunky windows that are going to be happy with having the vacuum on one side of them. Um, and then you can just sit a camera on the other side of them. Um, they can have various views. They can look at the whole machine as, as far as possible or very narrow views, depending on what we're trying to do with them. Um, this is an example of quite a nice image of just the inside of JET when it's actually operating. Um, I will point out that this is actually a real color image. Um, that's not false color or anything like that. That is actually what it would look like if you pressed your face up against the machine. Um, this lovely sort of purpley reddish color um, is actually just coming from hydrogen around the outside of the machine. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, actually. Um, and we can look at different wavelength ranges. Um, and when I say wavelength, it's wavelength basically means color effectively, uh, but it means it can expand outside the region of, of visible light. Um, so we normally use the term wavelength. Um, but we can use that to look in, for example, the infrared. Uh, we can look in the ultraviolet, and these can tell us different things about the plasma. Um, for example, here on the on the right, um, this is a superimposed image uh, with some temperature measurements that we've got from some cameras that work in the infrared. Um, and you can see on the edge here, on the, the inside of the machine, things are getting pretty, pretty hot, sort of near about a thousand degrees on the metals on the inside of the machine. This is when the plasma's uh, nearly touching it. And so we can use that for protection. Um, but the cameras do get used for all sorts of things. We have operations cameras um, that are used for control, protection cameras, and experimentation cameras as well. So that, that covers the whole gamut of different things we would want to do with diagnostics. And they're just normal looking cameras really most of the time, um, although they do tend to have um, optics that are designed to be able to deal with the radiation environments. Um, as well as actually having some pretty significant um, error checking memory and multiple memory banks, again, to deal with the kind of harsh environments inside the machine hall. And you can get an awful lot of, of different information from this. You can try to follow different impurities. You can understand densities, temperatures, um, as well as watching out for wall components before they get too hot and melt, which is always a useful thing to have. Um, another example is, uh, is called spectroscopy uh, as a passive diagnostic. And this is in many ways similar to cameras. Um, what you're doing, again, is, is measuring the electromagnetic radiation coming from the plasma, measuring the, the color and the intensity of it. Um, and there are lots and lots of different processes that happen inside a fusion plasma with you know, charged particles moving around that produce electromagnetic radiation across the whole spectrum. Um, and you can use these to infer um, everything from the, from the density of the plasma within your line of sight to temperatures. Um, and you can even do some clever things to understand um, electromagnetic fields um, with this light as well. I can talk about that a little bit if, if people are interested, if they ask questions about that later. Um, but this is an example just of a, a 2D slice of jet. Um, here, so the, this sort of grey background here is the, the sort of the physical machine and inside this red area is where you would normally have plasma inside the chamber. And these green uh, lines of sight and these uh, purple ones as well um, are just multiple different telescopes basically that um, look into the plasma and you take the light coming off from that and you can analyse it very carefully to give you all of these uh, bits of information from it. Um, just to give you an example of the kind of setup that you need to actually do the measurements, 
Um, this is an example from a sort of top-down view of the machine. Um, if this is the, the jet vessel over here on the right, um, we've got this very, very long, um, it's basically just a metal tube effectively that's supported in midair over here. And it goes through our, our very large uh, biological shield, which is about three meters of reinforced concrete, uh, which protects people outside from those high energy neutrons I mentioned earlier. And then all of our measuring equipment is just outside that. And that's how we can actually do our analysis. Um, another example of a, of a passive diagnostic is neutron monitors. So these neutrons come spraying out from the machine in all directions. Um, and you can learn an awful lot about it um, by understanding where those are coming from. Um, and the simplest way of doing this is having containers of material um, which can be affected uh, as neutrons strike it. It will either create a little bit of light um, or you'll see uh, some other kind of reaction and you can measure those reactions very easily. So you know when it's been hit by some neutrons. Um, and then you can literally just count how many instances you have. And by putting the monitors around the machine, you can figure out where they're coming from as well. So this is an example of uh, one of the neutron monitors. This is actually, uh, these are actually fission containers. So um, some of you may recognize the notation here for uranium-238 and uranium-235, um, which are actually quite fissile um, elements. Um, and the idea of these is that when they get hit by a neutron, you actually get a, a nuclear fission reaction. So similar to what you'd get in a, a fission power plant. Um, although these are optimized not to perform a chain reaction. You just get individual fission reactions that you can more easily measure. Um, and you can count those fission reactions and then you've got a, an idea of how many neutrons. Um, for scale, these things are about one and a half meters tall. Uh, they've got the weight on them. That's not the weight of just the uranium. That's the weight of the uranium and the rather large amount of lead shielding on the outside of them actually. So they are pretty big pieces of kit, 490 and 220 kilos respectively. Um, and from this, we can understand things like the reaction rate of the plasma. We're looking to try and produce neutrons effectively. Um, and this is another example of some neutron monitors. These are basically cameras. Um, so these are all lines of sight into the vessel. Um, and you have a, a material um, just before your camera that um, causes a small amount of light to be created when it's hit by a neutron. And then you capture those with the camera and you've got a nice um, measure of how many neutrons you've got for each line of sight. And you can do that vertically and horizontally, and you can produce a kind of a full map of what the machine looks like in terms of neutrons this way. Uh, moving on to some of the, the active diagnostics. So this is now when we're interfering with the plasma. Um, interfering. Um, so we start with interferometry. Um, and this is one of the, the more sort of straightforward to explain in certainly in hand wavy terms anyway. Um, basically you fire lasers through the plasma. Um, this is an example actually of one of the, uh, one of the start, starting lasers that we have. Uh, it doesn't really do it justice. This is a laser that basically takes up an entire room to actually produce before it gets fired through the plasma itself. Um, but what we do is we basically measure how long it takes to go through the plasma and compare that to the normal speed of light in a vacuum. Um, and it's slowed down by particles in its way and it will be slowed down more if there are more particles in its way. Um, unfortunately, I've just realized you can't see the, uh, the lines of sight too well here. Um, I think I can grab a quick pen um, and just show you we've sort of got some vertical ones here um, and some horizontal ones coming out from here as well. Um, and by doing that, um, we can get an idea of how many particles there are in these directions. Um, the key thing about this kind of measurement is that we can do this incredibly quickly. Uh, we can do this so fast that even on the time scales of plasma, where particles are moving at decent percentages of the speed of light, we can understand the density fast enough to do real time control of the density using this diagnostic. Um, you can also see it's a pretty substantial piece of equipment. This is a single diagnostic on jet, and this is a person here. Uh, these are actually train tracks um, that are used to allow this whole diagnostic to be removed and then moved back into where the machine is. Um, it's an enormous piece of equipment. 
and it gives you an idea when we talk about a diagnostic and you say oh it's a, a temperature measurement measurer you get this image of a little mercury thermometer it's not it's not quite like that it's a bit larger um, other active diagnostics um, you can use uh, things like scattering um, so this is another uh, basically firing a, another laser into the plasma um, but this works in a slightly different way the idea is that the laser will hit a particle and it will scatter off in some direction probably all directions um, but some of those will be scattered towards our collection optics. Um, I'll run through briefly how this one uh, travels. We have a laser in the roof, roof lab actually, um, that gets created here and fired down in towards the machine where it hits a little mirror and then gets sent horizontally into jet. Uh, when it's inside the machine, it will hit some of our plasma particles and it'll be scattered in multiple directions. Uh, some of them will be scattered in towards our collection optics up here where we have a mirror and then fired finally onto our fibers in the wall. Um, each fiber therefore represents a certain physical point inside the machine um, and we can build up a, a map basically of where, where those particles are. And again, the amount of light returning from that will tell you how many particles there are in the way. And it will also tell you where they are. So with this one, you can actually get a full map of the density inside. Um, and you can actually do some other clever, clever stuff with the light that's come back to give you things like the temperature, for example, from the Doppler effect, um, which is something you may be familiar with. Again, I'm happy to talk about it later if people are interested. Um, you can actually do these kinds of things with particle beams as well uh, in JET, but they're a little bit more complicated. Um, and final active diagnostic I'm going to talk about is actually impurity injection. Um, we're in the business of heating up hydrogen. We're not really in the business of heating anything else up. In fact, it's normally not very helpful. Um, but in the same way that you can uh, be given a, something to eat that's radioactive for uh, scans at the hospital, we can do the same thing with jet by injecting impurities. And the most fun of these is called laser ablation. Um, this is an example here of some of the, the targets that we have for, for laser ablation. Basically, these are very, very thin films of metal, um, and they're very uh, exotic metals, things like molybdenum um, and, and chromium and other things like that, that we wouldn't normally expect to find inside our machine. And you fire a laser at an individual spot. You can see there are lots of these individual little spots where lasers have been fired, and it blasts the material into the machine. Um, and because the impurity is rare, we can track that impurity using various other uh, diagnostics to see how it moves around. And you can follow that, you can infer the behavior of other particles from that. Um, this is an example, uh, basically, of just a, a single laser pulse. So here at the top is the first graph is just when our laser fired. So you can see very clearly it fired here. Um, and the important ones are the final three graphs here, where you're effectively seeing the light coming from various bits of the machine. And you can see how, as the impurity goes in, these, these respond rather quickly to that impurity coming in um, by the impurity emitting light. And that's detecting them on the way and thus understanding where it is and where it's going. Um, and that's very useful for us. Um, so I've talked a lot about uh, various different diagnostics. This is a summary, um, actually using some of the some of the terminology that we do use at JET. I won't go through everything. Um, those in in black are uh, examples of things I've talked about a little bit. Um, there are a lot of uh, acronyms here. I'll, I'll mention that NPA means neutral particle analysis. So these are just um, any any gas that's been created around the outside of the machine. Um, and here UV and VUV means ultraviolet and vacuum ultraviolet, which is even further into the towards gamma ray side of the, the light spectrum. But there's lots of spectroscopy that goes on, um, lots of cameras, um, and then there are other things like we measure the magnetics. Um, these X-rays are again uh, spectroscopic measurements. Um, and yeah, we can understand an awful lot. And the key really is that we need all of these diagnostics to give us a complete picture of the machine. It's not enough to just have one measurement of things. Um, I'll briefly talk about some advanced analysis you can do. You can get lots more information than you might think 
Um, this example is from spectroscopy, which is, is actually my area. Um, as I said, the, the light coming out um, is, uh, is important. And what color, what wavelength that light is, is actually dependent on what you've got inside your plasma. Um, so I've got an example graph here, and you can see that these, this is the intensity on the left, and this is the, the color, the wavelength at the bottom. Um, and you can see that different things, so this is tungsten here, this blue is very, very standard for tungsten. Um, but all of these spikes here, these green spikes are from carbon, and some of these red spikes are from beryllium and oxygen. And so you can see what is it different in the plasma. Um, the amount of light you get back can give you effectively the amount of particles and therefore the densities. Um, and this is a lovely picture uh, I've had through from one of our, our camera operators. Um, as I said, cameras and spectroscopy do share quite a lot of overlap in terms of their operation. And here you can just see um, the intensity of the light is showing you where the plasma kind of is. Here you can see it's sort of touching the sides. Here it's near the bottom. Um, and actually, during these periods, you can see it's, it's got a, a very high temperatures. Um, but the other key is you can see different colors in the top one and the bottom one. And that's because these plasmas are actually made of different things. So at the top, this is a, a normal hydrogen plasma that we operate with. And we sometimes use helium to make plasmas. And this one at the bottom here is an example of, of helium plasmas with different colors. Normally goes a bit more yellowy orange. Um, and there's even more uh, interesting things you can do. The temperature uh, broadens the color spectrum. This is the Doppler effect again. Um, and you can even get uh, more interesting things like magnetic electric fields. Um, you can understand turbulences and even impurities from it as well. Um, so what I'll leave you with is, is really the, the point that you need all of these things to understand what's going on. This is an example of a, a sort of um, summary plot of a single jet experiment we call a pulse. Um, and running you through what's going on here, um, these first two graphs here are basically just telling you kind of whether you have, how much plasma you have in the first place. Um, these both go negative. It's a little bit weird, but that's just to do with um, how we define things on jet. Um, basically, the plasma is always going backwards. Um, and so this tells you how much plasma there is to a certain extent. Um, this is telling you how much magnetic field there is. Um, then this graph is an example of one of our control graphs. So this is how much power we're putting in and from various different systems uh, into the machine. You can see at, at 47 and a half seconds, this is we put in an awful lot of power to the machine. Um, that responds in this graph in the top right here with, with lots of neutrons being produced. As you can see, once we stick the power on, we get lots of neutrons coming out. Um, it corresponds with an increase in density, which is what this graph is showing you, the second, uh, second from the top on the right. Um, corresponds again with an increase in temperature, um, again from various diagnostics. And then at the bottom here, these two, two graphs on the left and right give you an idea of the kind of impurities that are coming in. Um, on the left, this is a specific impurity that comes from the walls. Um, and on the right, this is effectively how dirty the plasma is getting. So as you can see, as much as we're getting it nice and hot and dense and all that's great, um, as the impurities come in, it gets dirtier and dirtier, which is, is not great um, for, uh, for continuing the plasma for a long time. So these are the kinds of things we need to understand. Um, and it's important that we can bring it all together to do so. Um, so that's really what I'm going to uh, leave you today. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you'd like to find out more, um, Cullum is, is available on the web, multiple different places. Um, you can always email communications, uh, our communications department. Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, various sort of social media accounts as well on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, and LinkedIn as well. Um, thank you all very much for listening. Um, I'm going to let um, Emily organize now some, some questions and things. Um, and I will do my best to answer any of them. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so you've got four questions at the moment. Um, first question uh, from Daniel. How does the uranium differ in these vessels in comparison to the uranium inside of a nuclear reactor? Um, so that's a very good question, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I don't know too much detail about it. 
Um, but the way that a uh, nuclear fission reactor is set up um, is designed so that the, uh, the uranium um, has, a, it makes it very easy for chain reactions to ha happen. So you have quite a lot of uranium within uh, close proximity to more uranium. So when you actually cause one fission reaction to happen, that creates more neutrons, which causes more fission reactions to happen. Now, if you have smaller amounts of uranium, but dotted around with lots of lead in between to absorb neutrons, you can stop those chain reactions from happening. They, they can't possibly uh, continue. And so I imagine that is how they're designed inside our, our fission chambers. You have small little areas where you have a tiny bit of uranium um, and those will absorb one neutron. You'll get one fission reaction, but that won't cause a cascade of more of them just because of the, the physical way it's set up, basically. Great. Um, and there's another question here. Um, on those uranium neutron monitors, what is the enrichment level? Oh, now that's a good question. I'm afraid that one, that one is one I'm just going to have to straight up admit I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, I imagine the one that's, at, that's, the fact that they are separated by isotope, there's one that says U238 and one that says U235. Um, I imagine the fact that they're separated by isotope means that the, the 238 is going to be incredibly low enrichment. I don't know if the 235 implies it's maybe just slightly higher than, two, than the, the standard 238 or whether it's pure 235. I imagine probably not. Um, pure 235 would be pretty hard to get. Um, it's certainly a question I can take, uh, take to those in charge of the neutron monitors if you're interested, more than happy. If you, if you want to email communications or something, I'm sure we could get that information for you. Great, thank you. Um, and there's another one here. Um, radiation is much less for fusion in comparison to fission. Mm -hmm. um, but by repeated usage, are we having residual radiation, which actually adds up to the radiation as a whole? Um, so, yeah, so that's, it's a good point that it's, it's lower in radiation than, um, than uh, nuclear fission in terms of the amount that's produced overall in these devices. Um, it's more about the, the problem with nuclear fission is more about the waste that's produced. Um, when you're actually operating um, both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion produce neutrons that are that are coming out from the, the machine and it is the machine itself is radioactive in operation. The key with with fusion is that it doesn't have a, the, the waste product is literally just helium. Whereas with a fission plant, the waste product that you produce is, um, is spent fuel, which is whatever the uranium has split into. And those can normally be pretty nasty um, nucleotides, uh, which you don't get at all with, with fusion. Um, what you do do is you do irradiate the machine over time. You're quite correct. Um, with the kinds of, of power that we normally use in, in jet, um, the machine does get radioactive over time. Um, but that being said, it decays pretty quickly, uh, certainly at the moment. I mean, uh, we can have operations going on on, on a Sunday uh, or sorry, normally on a Friday, and I can wander in as a, a diagnostician to do some work on a Saturday morning with, with no trouble. Um, it does build up over a long campaign. We have had, uh, have had days where you, know, you can't go in during a weekend because the, the levels are a bit too high. Um, but that is us being very, very careful. Um, we do have very, very uh, low tolerances on the amount of radiation that workers can have, of course. I hope I've answered your question there. I may have strayed slightly from it. If, if I haven't, please do pop something again in the Q&A. Great. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, and how did you start your career as a diagnostic physicist? Do people tend to analyze all the data or specialize in a certain method? Uh, okay, that's a, a great question. Um, so my career, um, I was, was sort of very lucky. Um, I knew I was interested in fusion for, for quite some time. I think I, I discovered it in um, late secondary school at about A level. Um, I was actually, I sort of discovered it and, and then was taken actually to JET for a tour um, by my dad uh, and really enjoyed it. And I sort of always knew like it was something interesting, which is not 
something that, that most people tend to be able to say. Uh, but I basically just did a, um, I did a physics degree um, at, at Warwick University and I applied for the graduate scheme at, at Cullum. Um, and I, I got onto that graduate scheme and um, basically I was, I was trained up from there effectively uh, to become a, a diagnostic physicist. Um, just, as a, just to promote that actually, um, that graduate scheme is still going on um, and uh, we do take people every year. The, uh, I don't know when the applications will open for next year. Um, it'll be for September the next year, but just worth mentioning that. Um, your, the second part of your question was about um, analyzing data um, and uh, I think I can see it here. Um, yeah, analyzing all data or specializing in certain methods. There's a huge amount of data that's produced from this. Um, we run an experiment about every 20 minutes on a, a normal operation day and that experiment will produce something on the order of 50 gigabytes of raw data and that's before anything's been analyzed. So we can't possibly all analyze it um, in, in full detail. So yeah, people do normally have certain things they specialize in. Um, and uh, personally, as, as responsible officer for a particular diagnostic, my job is to make sure that all that data is available and understandable, and then perhaps to have one or two uh, methods that I'm particularly interested in, particular things that I can get out of my diagnostic. And there are entire other uh, research groups who are interested in another particular type of thing that you can get out of that diagnostic. Um, and normally they will put lots of different diagnostics together to, to get a more holistic approach to it. But a very interesting question. Thank you. Great. Um, and we've got another one here saying, how long do you need to uh, run the machine to get enough useful information? Oh, um, so uh, again, <laughs> Some very good questions here, very interesting stuff. Um, so because of computers, um, you can actually run fusion machines for a very, very short time and still get some useful information. Um, now it does depend on what you're trying to do. Um, obviously we're trying to build a fusion power plant in the future and for a power plant, you want it to be running for really long periods of time. And so some of the information that you need, you can only get by running machines for a long time. By long time, I mean days at a time is, is what we're aiming for, for, for a power plant. Um, but that doesn't mean that the smaller behavior of a plasma can't be analyzed in a shorter time. So I mentioned we've got two devices on site. Uh, one is called JET, one is called MAST, and MAST is the mega amp spherical tokamak. Now, MAST is currently up undergoing an upgrade and its previous um, pulse time, its experimentation time, was about half a second. But that's still very, very useful. There's still a huge amount of stuff we can do with that. And with you know, computer-controlled laser diagnostics, you're not too limited by, by time uh, once you're up at about half a second or so. Now, that being said, the longer you can run, of course, the more information you can get and the more you can manipulate the plasma over a longer period, so the more information you can get. Um, as I said, it's currently undergoing an upgrade, which will actually increase its, its pulse time to about five seconds or so, um, which is great for the diagnostics that are already set up for really fast time capture. So they'll be getting loads more data. Um, jet plasmas last about, you know, about 40 seconds or so on average is the whole pulse length. Um, and as we scale up to build bigger and bigger machines, the next one that's being built in the south of France called ETA, um, we'll be running for on the order of minutes um, to get data for, for future things. Great. Um, there's a question here from George saying, in a fission reactor, um, once the reaction starts, it becomes self-sustaining by controlling the chain reaction. Mm. Is there a kind of self-sustaining fusion chain reaction, or do you need to feed the reaction to keep the reactor running? That is an excellent question. Um, there is effectively a, a self-sustaining uh, way of, of looking at the fusion reaction, but it's a slightly it's a slightly different um, it's slightly different sort of way of becoming self-sustaining, and it's actually not essential for fusion. I'll, I'll try and explain. Basically, for fission reactions to happen, um, you need a neutron moving a particular particle moving at a particular speed to actually initiate these reactions. 
So to become self-sustaining, you need to produce lots of those neutrons so that you can keep the reaction going. With fusion, the only, condition, the only conditions that we need to keep the thing going are a decent temperature and a decent density and keeping that going for a, a good time. So there is a way it can become self-sustaining, which is producing its own heat to keep itself hot rather than us having to heat it all the time. But it's not essential for a fusion power plant. Granted, it's useful because the fewer, you know, if you don't have to have tons of heating systems running, A, you're not wasting energy on that. And B, if they fail, you don't, you know, if you can turn them all off and just let the machine keep going, that would be really useful. Um, the way that self-sustaining thing can happen um, is that basically looking at the, the fusion reaction, if I go back to my second slide, um, we talked a lot about this neutron. This is the, the neutron that comes out is actually how we would capture the energy and siphon it off to, to produce power. But this helium does hang around inside the reaction, uh, inside the reactor because it's magnetically charged. So it starts following the magnetic field. And if you're producing enough fusion reactions, these, um, these helium particles produced do have extra energy that's come from the fusion reaction. And so that extra energy can be used, will effectively heat the plasma up. And so instead of us having to add heat, it will heat itself. Um, we tend to refer to that as ignition uh, in, in fusion circles. Um, it's something we suspect ITER may well achieve the conditions for. Um, we're not sure uh, because there's a lot about ITER that's, that's unsure at this, uh, at this moment in terms of the physics. Um, but uh, it's very interesting. If you are interested, um, please do look up um, yeah, fusion ignition um, and you'll, you'll get a lot of information there. But yeah, very interesting question. Thank you. Great. Um, we've got another one here saying, does the plasma need to move in a particular direction or does it not matter? Um, so in terms of the, the plasma in, in, uh, in a tokamak, um, the only key really is that it moves in one direction rather than, than sort of alternating. Um, basically, it will, it will sort of spin round the central column in either one direction or the other. And that is driven entirely by which direction we, uh, we force it when we start the whole machine up. Um, you could sort of imagine in, if, you, if you try to spin it one way and then force particles moving at sort of decent percentages of the speed of light to all of a sudden go the other direction. That might be quite tricky. Um, although that being said, I have been told it's been done in JET before. Um, I don't understand in, in my mind how that could happen, but apparently it has been done. So it's very interesting as a thought experiment. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid that's sort of the limit of, of my knowledge on that bit. Great, thank you. Um, Christos here is asking, um, will the slides be made available after the talk, which they will be? I'll be uploading them on YouTube and sharing them on social media. Um, and then we've got two left. So we've got, um, is, is fusion, I think somebody here is basically, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, um, but the benefits of um, fusion over fission when it comes to waste. Okay, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a good question about waste. Um, the advantage that, that fusion has um, over, over fission is basically, uh, it's, it's sort of twofold. Um, the first one is that it doesn't have the potential for um, particularly, um, it doesn't have the potential for chain reactions to uh, continue unchecked um, and cause issues, you know, like nuclear meltdowns and things like that. Um, that being said, um, I don't work for nuclear fission, um, but uh, nuclear fission reactors nowadays are built in particular ways um, that do make that kind of thing, um, you know, a, a chain nuclear reaction spiraling out of control, not possible. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't melt still, but it, it can't uh, cause a, a nuclear explosion or something like that. Um, but the other, the, the main advantage that fusion has is that when you use uh, nuclear fission, your fuel is something like uranium-235. And when you have a reaction, the resulting products are two quite high mass um, particles, two high mass nuclei. And they, by pure chance, may well be quite high radioactivity um, nuclei. Uh, 
it depends exactly what it splits into, but some of those products are very radioactive. And you use kilograms and kilograms of fuel, which means that over time you're producing kilograms and kilograms of potentially quite high level radioactive waste. With fusion, the only output that you get from the basic reaction is helium. And helium is perfectly normal. In fact, it would be useful to have more helium. Uh, we're sort of running out of it because it escapes the Earth's gravity. Um, not that we'll produce sufficient helium to solve that problem, I'm afraid. But uh, the point is, it's not a bad thing to have. Um, as I said earlier, you do irradiate your machine over time. So your machine becomes radioactive and you have to deal with that as a waste product. Um, but even then, um, you only get your machine to, um, according to the simulations that I've um, talked to people about at this stage anyway, even in a fusion power plant, you only end up with the machine being what we would call low level uh, radioactive waste. So you wouldn't be producing even medium to high level uh, radioactive waste. And even then it's just your machine components, not something that's going in and coming out in kilograms day by day. Great. Right, we've only got one la uh, last question. Um, and I think, um, this person's basically asking if we can clarify. Um, well, I think I can, I can read it here. I don't know if it's yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> screen share, screen share. Right. Uh, but Anup's asking about um, energy or heat basically means movement of, of particles. Are we balancing the temperature with the high powered magnets and making the particles move? I'm trying to emulate the movement of particles which is happening in the sun. Um, so um, just to explain a little bit about uh, the machine that I, I sort of may have glossed over a little bit in the early slides. Um, the magnetic field uh, is really there to confine the particles, to make sure that they don't uh, leave um, that magnetic field and hit the machine. Um, when we're operating jet, we have about five grams or so of fuel in there at any one time. And the, you know, the, the structure is about a thousand tons of metal. So if those particles come out, um, they're going to hit that metal and immediately cool down. And that's no good. We need to keep it really, really hot. So the, the magnetic fields are there just to keep it in place. And then we actually heat it up uh, with various other methods. Um, so if I go to my one of my, my final slide, actually, um, this graph here, if I go enlarge, um, this graph here is showing the various different heating methods uh, that we use to actually heat the plasma up. Um, I won't go into detail. Um, a lot of information is, is on the website and, and things like that, and actually probably in some other talks, in fact, um, that I would recommend you watch if you're interested, probably on YouTube. Um, but these are the various heating methods that we use. The, these, this thing, this graph above it is showing you the magnetic field, and then uh, this graph is showing you where we're doing the heating. So these are the neutral beams coming on. Um, this is uh, some of our wave heating, um, and we use those to get things up to temperature. Pretty significant as well. This is near, nigh, nigh on 30 million watts worth of, of power going into five grams of material. Um, that's an awful lot of, of power going into that material. Something like, that's like 40,000 40, horsepower or something, if I use a, a weird unit. Uh, but just to give you a sense of scale. Oh, and um, just before I leave, I notice uh, we've got temperatures expected in a fusion reactor in full operation. Um, so yeah, we'd be looking at something like the what I mentioned at the start, which is on the order of 10 times the core of the sun. Um, so about 50, 150 to 200 million degrees is the kind of temperature that we're looking at for individual particles. Um, so they've got an awful lot of energy, uh, which is what they need to overcome that electrostatic repulsion from the two particles. Great. I think that is our, our Q&A section uh, done. Um, if you do have further questions or anything like that, um, as I said at the, the end of the talk, um, please do email our, our communications group. Um, and if it's a question for me, I'm sure they'll, they'll be happy to pass it on to me. Um, but thank you all very much for, for listening along. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I don't know if Emily has anything further that she needs to mention. No, that's perfect. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Well, thank you all very much.